My name is Giselle. This is Slow Food Live. If you're not familiar with Slow Food, Slow Food is an international grassroots movement and we promote good, clean, and fair food for all. We, it began in Italy 30 years ago and um, less than 30 years ago, maybe three months ago, two months ago when the stay at home orders started, we, we launched Slow Food Live as a way to bring slow food into your home and your garden and your kitchen and your life. And it's been really wonderful to engage with all of you here and get, get everybody empowered and enabled to do some gardening and cooking at home and making things that maybe you haven't made before or at least getting to connect with folks like Kelly to answer your questions and make you feel a little more expert in whatever it is you're doing at home. So today we have Kelly McGlinchey. She's in Manhattan. She's a longtime member and supporter and advocate of Slow Food and very active and I'm super grateful for all of your great work, Kelly, and also for joining us today to teach us some things about urban gardening. So I'm gonna turn this over to Kelly to tell us a little bit more about yourself and then we'll just get right into it. I told Giselle before, uh, before we got started, you may hear some sirens uh, and some other noises uh, in the background. I am live right now in my garden in the middle of Manhattan. Um, and I'm really all about urban gardening and also just gardening in small spaces um, or indoor spaces. Um, so I, 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 just by way of introduction, um, I run a in New York City called Table and Table. It's focused on helping good food businesses cultivate success and grow their impact. And we do that um, by through through sustainability and social impact strategy consulting and also general business development services for mission driven companies in the food sector. Um, I also, as Giselle mentioned, have had the great pleasure of serving as board co-chair of Slow Food New York City for the past uh, over, over three years now. Um, and we actually also here in New York City through our urban harvest uh, that's dedicated to promoting through school gardens in the city and we also run an urban farm in East New York Brooklyn I've been doing that for 10 years uh, where we get kids onto the farm um, community members onto the farm and again uh, really encourage New Yorkers to engage with the landscape um, in, in new and interesting ways um, so today what I'm going what I'd like to talk to you all about is I'm going to share a little bit about my journey in home gardening uh, I've lived in New York City for almost a decade now and I've lived in five apartments during that time um, and I have found a way to grow something in each apartment that I've lived in even if it was just a few herbs in a windowsill um, so this is a topic I'm I'm really passionate about and you know as Giselle shared over the past couple of uh, months in the past seven to eight weeks with everything happening in the world right now my silver lining has been that there's been this incredible surge of interest in in gardening and taking time to with the soil and reconnect with the land. And, um, you know, it, I think there's a lot of beauty that can come out of that. I know I've certainly gotten a lot of inquiries from friends and family members who are saying, you know, how do I, how do I start? Uh, where do I start? Um, and my answer is always consistently somewhere. Find, a, find one plug-in um, and don't be afraid to, to make a mistake. I know I make mistakes in the garden all the time. Um, but really, you know, get, be ready to jump in and get started. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to give you a little virtual tour of the garden with Giselle's help. Now, I could, I could give you the entire tour from where I am sitting right now by rotating my camera. Um, but in the interest of higher, hope, hopefully higher visual and audio quality, what we're going to do is show you some, some video visuals of the garden, and I'll, ta I'll talk you through some of the things that have guided our urban garden design here in New York City um, in our home, and then also share some, some uh, lessons that I've learned that hopefully you can apply in your home garden. Um, you know, whether you've been gardening for years or you're tuning in today because you have no idea where to get started, um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can walk away today together with some, some ideas um, on how to get growing this season. Um, so with that in mind, um, Giselle, I would love if you could cue up our first video. Um, and I'm going to start by giving you all a little 
orientation of, of where we are. Um, so Giselle, whenever you are ready. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So great. Awesome. So, uh, for, for context, we are, our garden is located, um, in close to Midtown Manhattan. We're about 20 blocks north of Times Square and Central Park is less than a mile to our west. Uh, so we're, we're truly in the middle of Manhattan. Uh, the space is 200 square feet in size and in the peak season is home to over 80 plant varieties. Um, now in the, the beginning of May, you know, the garden is just starting to hit its late spring stride. Um, so every day, day I come out here this time of year, there's something, something new uh, growing and uh, new flowers coming into bloom. Um, we, as you can see actually in that footage gives a really good picture, we have a really nice open view to the East River for those of you who are more familiar with New York and over into Queens. And what that means for our garden is we actually happen to be in this really nice pathway for birds and pollinators because of our open access to um, uh, and, and proximity to the river, um, which is really wonderful. When we moved in, uh, this is our third we're coming into our third season here in the garden. Um, and when we moved into this space, it was just patio tiles. Um, we're, we rent, we, we don't own this space. Um, so, you know, we had to kind of work around uh, what, work with what we had um, and also really get to know the space before making any major changes. Um, so everything you're seeing here, the, the planters, the border boxes, that little deck, if you, if you caught that, um, all of that we put in in the first year that we started growing here. Before we did that though, we took a lot of time getting to know the space. And that's a big, um, some big advice that I would share wherever you are in the country right now. Um, and especially if you're new and, and thinking of getting started, don't skip that part. Take time getting to know where the sun hits your, in your particular space. How long does it sit there for? Um, do you have a particularly you know, uh, shady spot? Um, how much moisture do you have if you do have an outdoor space? All of these are important in, in what will ultimately be your path to choosing the plants that are right for your space. And we're gonna talk about that. Um, one of our key principles in designing this space, and here this this pond image that we're a little bit stuck on right now is actually a great example. We we have been, really tried to reuse and upcycle wherever and whenever we we could with this garden. So we have um, this this pond mini mini pond you could call it. It's a small space pond. Um, was actually a pot, a beautiful pot that was abandoned in the middle of the courtyard of our building. Um, so that the, the pond there um, was a great example of just of upcycling um, a, a pot that was not being used, abandoned in the courtyard. Um, and by putting a, a little solar powered pump in there, which you can see actually right behind me, um, we've created a nice little space for birds to come and drink or bathe. Uh, during the summer, we have, we have fish in there. Um, we're able to grow some plants in there. And it's a great, uh, a great component for us to, to our um, the other element I was going to share was that a lot of the, the, actually all of the border boxes that you saw there were used or were made using reclaimed wood. We were extremely lucky to happen to come by uh, a large stockpile of, of wood that from a demolition site at a local garden center that they were going to throw away. Um, so we managed to get that back to our apartment um, up to our, our sixth floor uh, apartment space up the stairs to our garden um, and we're able to construct some all of our border boxes the raised bed that you see there um, and then also some of the cherry box uh, cherry cherry box planters and other planters around the space are made using reclaimed uh, uh, wood pallets um, so again you know for us that that element of, of really looking at how what, what we could do with this space was an important part before we started doing all of that building and, um, and structuring. And the other piece, um, before we kind of move into the, net, the uh, keep going with the video, is that we, we took a look at sort of where, where we're located right now. So you, so you may have seen in that, uh, in that clip there that we have a very bright white building that right now is reflecting a lot of light on me to my, to my left, your right. 
Um, and that's a really interesting element that we took into account, bef again, before we started choosing where plants were gonna go. We are on the north side of the building right now, so typically you might not think that's ideal for, um, for certain plants, but actually we get a good amount of light for the first part of the day because of that open access to the, to the East River. We get really good morning light. And then again, this white building um, right, ne right across from us reflects light in for a good majority of the day. Um, so again, these are the elements that are very specific to my space. And the first thing you wanna do if you're just getting started is really get to know those unique elements of your space. So Giselle, we can keep going with that video. Thank you. So again, you know, we, we have, we're north facing, so we get really good light in the uh, one section of the garden for a good majority of the day. Um, but for about two, -thir two, about two thirds of the garden, is in shade for the rest of the day. About two thirds of our garden is in shade uh, from 2 p.m. onward. So what we've done there is, as you've seen here, we've planted a lot of ferns in the back. We actually call it the for forest border. Uh, it's only about four feet long, um, but it's our little mini forest border where we have ostrich ferns and other shade tolerant plants. Um, and here we actually have a rain barrel that is, that's our water source for the, for our 200 square foot garden. And at the top, it looks a little scraggly right now, but it does, it's super happy in the summer months. Um, we have spearmint up there, vinca vine, um, and other elements that are totally happy being in shade for, for the majority of the day. The other thing that we've done with our garden space is really tried to optimize vertical growing space. Now there's not a lot, you can see um, what you're looking at there and what's right behind me right now is our a chimney. Um, and it's great, again, unique element of our garden is we have this really nice uh, brick wall that absorbs heat throughout the day. Um, and is our, we have grow, we've grown beans up there for the past two summers, which love it. Um, and they'll be there again this summer. So right now, nothing growing behind me, uh, but it's a great, a great use of vertical space. And what that's allowed us to do, you can see we have trellises. Again, last summer on these trellises, I had tomatoes. Um, I have a raspberry behind me that we've trellised up. And last year, we also added um, a, an arbor that, is, that was built by my partner. And you can see we've actually started growing. This is, it's only second year. We're growing Concord grapes on it um, and it's already starting to show uh, the first buds of its flowers. So we're hoping we'll get some fruit this summer, fingers crossed. Um, honeysuckle and this honeysuckle and these, the grape that you're seeing here are great examples where those do want the sun, but what we've given them is a structure to grow up and reach that sunlight. Um, and thus we're, we're maximizing our space, right? We probably have about at least double the square footage Perfect, thank you, Giselle. Um, we have at least double the square footage in our vertical space. Um, and I will tell you, you know, this is, I am still learning. I call my garden our, 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 my classroom. Um, and, I, and I truly mean it. I mean, it, the vertical space for me is sort of my next big project. And every year we, we add a, a, a new element that allows us to experiment and test um, and, and really, you know, learn how we can maximize that, that um, vertical footprint that we have here as well. Um, you may have seen also, and you can actually see uh, behind me this way, we have some heather fencing that I um, uh, purchased on Amazon actually, was able to get up here. And it, one, provides us a little bit of privacy on our, uh, on our deck space, but again, also allows things like morning glory, which we typically grow here in the summer months, um, to find little nooks and crannies to cling on, on to and grow quite happily in that space. Um, so... We can come back, uh, Giselle, I'm gonna, before we go to the next video, I'll, 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 um, I'm gonna share a few little stories and then we'll move to the next clip if that works. Um, but if you're, you know, this is the largest garden space I've ever personally gardened in, 200 square feet uh, for, for some context. My, my previous garden, my first garden in New York City was a very awkward patch of, of dirt that was about 12 inches wide by eight feet long. And it was my first New York City apartment. Uh, and I sort of naively went to the landlord and said, said, well, can I, can I grow here? You know, it's just weeds right now. Um, I don't think he'd ever gotten the question before. And so he said, sure. Um, and I, that first summer had mint, beans, Malabar spinach, um, Swiss chard. I attempted a cherry tomato. It didn't quite get enough sunlight to thrive, but we got, a, I got a few green fruits, uh, that I was able, able to use. Um, 
And that garden for years after I moved out had mint growing in it. So we'll talk about mint a little bit later, but uh, for me, that garden really demonstrated the, the, the power of growing some seeds and some dirt. It can be as simple as that. Um, it can be much more complicated, for, certainly, and there are experts um, out there who, who you know, have plenty to teach and plenty to share. Um, but my, one of the biggest things that I've learned over the past you know, five or so uh, apartments that I've lived in in New York City is just giving something a try can really, um, can really be informative and fun. That should be fun. Um, all right, so Giselle, we can queue up the next video if you're ready. Thank you. Um, and what I want to talk about, you know, next, so we just kind of talked through, um, you know, getting to know your space, embracing what you have to work with. And now I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, once you're at that stage where you, you feel like you've done that planning process, right? Well, how do you know what to do next? And what are the things that you should be thinking about? So I'm going to share some of the principles that we think about, um, you know, for for an urban, if you're in an urban environment or you're trying, thinking about growing indoors or you just have a small, small, um, you know, home that you're working from, our biggest resource for, for us urban gardeners, right, is space. Um, it's the thing that is the most, most valuable and most precious and often most limited. So you really want to be thinking about how you can maximize the health and the, the longevity of whatever it is that you do choose to grow, even if it's one mint plant. How can you maximize the health of that one mint plant? Um, so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the plants that we've chosen in our garden, that this is a chocolate mint that's growing at the base of the, the Concord grape plant. Um, and we do have a good number of shrubs, perennials, trees, but we've chosen specifically chosen plants that are happy growing in containers. As you may have seen, you know, that's what our garden is, is all containers and one raised bed. Um, so we have a couple of dwarf cherry trees. This one is a variety called Carmine Jewel. Uh, we have a couple of dwarf blueberry plants, including a very cute jelly bean blueberry. Um, and then we also have, uh, behind me is actually a, a heritage red raspberry that's a Cornell uh, variety that's really high yielding and does really well in containers. So think about the plants that you are, you know, again, think about that choice. You're not gonna be able to grow, if you're tuning in today and you have a small space or you're in an urban environment um, or you have a small balcony or just one windowsill, it goes without saying, but I'll say it, you won't be able to grow everything that your heart desires. So you're gonna have to make some, some hard choices um, about what it is that, you grow, that you're gonna grow that season. Once you make those hard choices, again, invest fully in the health of those plants. One of the ways that we do that in our small space, again, to maximize the, um, the oomph, right, the, the, the benefit and the, uh, the productivity of a single pot is through companion planting. So here you can see in our cherry box planters around the cherry tree, we have strawberries, alpine strawberries, um, tulips and cro crocus that die back after this time of year. They, we just missed, you can see them there, but they were just in their full spring glory. Um, we have alliums, uh, garlic, all of which are known to grow well together and help prevent um, fungal diseases and pests that might, uh, that might be harmful uh, to your plants. Um, again, I'm actually looking at this Concord grape here. My plan in terms of companion planting this season, I've got a couple of um, bean plants that I'm planning, one, planning to put one of them in there to grow up and around uh, the grape as a nice companion from a trellis, trellising standpoint. Um, the, the other piece, you know, when thinking about health in uh, health of your plants, health of your garden, and health for yourself, is really planting and gardening for biodiversity. I'm with biodiversity in mind. And this is a huge principle for, for Slow Food. It's one of the things that attracted me first to the organization is the emphasis on biodiversity um, and its importance in our food system. So when we, you know, when we here in our home, home are thinking about what we're gonna grow for this season, we give a lot of thought to 
interesting varieties, heirloom varieties, the stories behind particular seeds. Um, you know, one, because it, it just makes it more, uh, you know, again, more interesting, um, both to plan for, but also to eat. Uh, and also because it's, it's, there's a, and it, you're, you're taking an environmental um, step forward in the right direction by promoting uh, diversity of plants in your garden. So here, um, it's again a little choppy, but the radishes are right now what I am uh, singing, singing my the praises to and recommending to everyone. Um, it's the this is the first year that I've grown radishes in this particular garden, and they have quickly become um, a favorite, and they will be a stalwart year over year. Um, they, if you have a small space and you have a little balcony, I would highly recommend, you know, getting a, getting a small container and doing some radishes, especially if you have kids. I'm sure people, if you have gardening friends, they may have recommended radishes before, um, but they're quick to grow, easy to harvest, beautiful. Um, here we're growing a, a, a variety, a, a mix, excuse me, of purple plum radishes and also, um, excuse me, and also an Easter bas basket radish mix from Hudson Valley Seed Co. So on, on biodiversity, you know, an important component of, it's not just about promoting the biodiversity of the plants you're growing, but also really, tr really trying to attract life into your garden. Um, so again, if you have outdoor space, you may not want to be doing that if you have an indoor space. I know that I try to minimize the amount of critters <laughs> that I have in my indoor garden space, although it doesn't always work. Um, but if you have access to an outdoor space, then doing anything you can to promote uh, insects, pollinators, birds to come through to your garden is a really great thing to do for, for your plants, and it's also pleasurable. So we do that in a number of ways in our 200 square foot space. Um, we, we do get, as I mentioned before, a lot of birds in this space, which is very, I, I love, um, mostly morning doves and, uh, and sparrows and house finches, which you'll see here momentarily. Um, but, you know, with the, with the wildlife come the pests. I remember our first season growing up here, I was quite surprised to find a whole slew of slugs um, and snails, you know, slow food snails that had managed to find their way up here about 12 stories up in the middle of Manhattan. Um, aphids, you may have seen, you know, we, uh, even this time of year, I can look to my left and there are pansies that are right now um, just ha host to a number of uh, aphids that the ants are happily taking care of and feeding um, and you know we with our cherry trees last year which you can see here we did have an aphid uh, issue that was starting to sort of to, to make me a little concerned about the health of the tree so we took some you know I, I basically hand washed the leaves with a with a mild uh, safe soap for the garden rather than using any chemicals um, but I didn't completely wipe the population out and even now again there are aphids that are living here and it's it's about balance we're really trying to create balance within the space um, you, you saw maybe just now we have um, insect houses, ladybug houses, pitcher plants around the garden here and there. And it may just be one or two, um, you know, or usually actually just one specimen of a particular plant variety. But again, for us, we're really trying to optimize the amount of biodiversity, the amount of variety within this small square space. Um, you know, we, we actually, the, uh, on the wildlife topic, um, Last year, we had a number of fennel plants, and within a matter of weeks, uh, a black swallowtail butterfly had um, had clearly come by because we had a, a, a three caterpillars that were happily living on on the fennel. Um, and dill and fennel, I then learned, are preferred host plants for black swallowtail butterflies. Um, we also, in our first season, I was growing an heirloom variety of squash on the brick wall behind me, and the first flower opened up, and I was so excited to come see. Uh, our first flower had bloomed on this, this one squash plant. It had opened up, and I came out an hour later, and there was a, uh, this beautiful 
green beetle. This is going to reveal my uh, how the the beginning the beginning of my gardening knowledge to the more experienced gardeners on here. But I came out and there was this what I perceived as a beautiful green beetle with black little dots. And I was like, well, I have to find out what this gorgeous beetle is that's come right to my Lakota squash in the middle of Manhattan. And of course, it was a cucumber beetle, uh, which is devastating to squash plants. Um, and I I just find that story sort of for me it's still fascinating that this one I can't imagine there are many squash plants on this one stretch of uh, 65th Street here in the middle of Manhattan. Uh, and this cucumber beetle had found the squash blossom within literally two hours of it opening. Um, life will find a way. That is what my garden teaches me each and every day. Um, and what we're going to move into next is really the foundation of everything I just said, which is building healthy soil. Um, I, you know, we have this, this, our little um, rolling composter is, <laughs> Its tagline, if you look it up online, is actually the world's cutest composter, which I just think is hysterical. Um, and, you know, it's, it is what we can fit in our space. I would love to one day have a three bin system uh, for, for compost where I can, um, you know, really do volume. Um, but this, is, this allows us to compost some of our food scraps. What you just saw there was, was a worm bin. Um, and for those of you, even if you have zero access to outdoor space, I would highly recommend doing a starting your own worm bin, which is a whole nother slow food live session, but I'm, it's worth bringing up in the context of urban gardening. Um, in the five apart New York City apartments where I've lived, I've had worm bins in four of them. And uh, often the worm bin was, sit was located in a simple bucket system under my kitchen sink. Uh, so if you are looking to, you know, if, if you're looking to start growing in your space, um, I can assure you that not only can you have a couple of nice, you know, uh, leafy herbs in your windowsill, you can also add to your apartment space if you so, if you so desire. Um, so, I got, so thank you, Giselle, were we good on the video there? Great. Thank you. Um, so you know, again, thinking about kind of recapping here, uh, those are some of the elements that we've used to really guide our urban gardening space here in, in this particular space. Uh, again, what's been important is getting to know this space, working with rather than against what we have, and then making the choices for our garden uh, that were right for us. And it's not going to be the same. Um, you know, I wish it would be easy for me to say, well, go grow some, you know, uh, butterhead lettuce. That's going to be, that's the easy solution uh, for any urban gardener. But you really have to get to know what you're working with within your home uh, before making those choices. So what I'd like to do now, and then we're going to open it up for questions in, in just a moment, um, but I'd like to share a little, uh, a little demonstration with you all of a trick that I have done this, this year for my urban garden space uh, that hopefully, you know, some of you will be able to do in your home. Um, you know, I was, I'll share, this is sort of an example of one of my big gardening principles, which is that experimentation is key. And part of experimenting is a degree of failure. Sometimes it's a high degree of failure. And if you talk to most experienced gardeners, you're probably going to, um, or beginner gardeners, walk away with some story of, um, you know, of mistakes and lessons learned. So I have definitely had things in our garden or tried things that did not work so well. Um, and then I've also had some great successes that have become stalwarts in the way that I garden. Um, so what I'm going to share with you here today, I'm going to show you here, again, like I said, um, upcycling is a big part uh, and reusing and just trying to get sort of thrifty and crafty is a, is a big element of what we do in our urban garden space. Um, so this is a, a, a bowl that we've had from New Year's, actually, a couple of good friends brought over, um, I believe there were fortune cookies in here. It was a beautiful sort of presentation and we just had the bowl laying around. Um, and I was, you know, I've been looking for some creative planters. I also have been at home for, for weeks now. So I'm really working with what I have in our home space in terms of planters, seeds, uh, uh, soil, all of it. 
Um, so we drilled some holes into the bottle, as you can, if you can see that here, just to make sure it has some good drainage. Um, and if you have a, a bowl, an old, you know, uh, aluminum foil uh, container that's sizable enough, you can do this, what I'm about to show you also. We're going to make a little salad bowl planter, and I'm just going to get set up here. So bear with me as I move the computer back. You all can see. Um, so <clears throat> what I'm going to show you here, uh, is not a perfect science, which is why I want, want to walk you through this. So again, drainage holes in the bottom. Um, I will tell you, I have used old teapots that didn't have any drainage holes and grown sage in a windowsill perfectly fine. So while it is ideal to drill some drainage holes or find something that, that can allow water to come through, um, there are success stories of certain plants. Again, they want, plants want to survive, right? They're gonna try to find a way to adapt to the conditions you give them. Um, what I typically do with container growing is I'll, I have um, a terracotta, I'll show you here. Whenever a pot breaks, I save the shards of the terracotta uh, pots that I use because they come in real handy for drainage and also for, uh, for containers like this. And what I'm gonna do is just put these right on, place them on top here. What that's gonna do is a couple of things. One, it'll stop the, it'll ensure good drainage so that the water is flowing through and that the soil isn't clogging up those holes, right? So I'm gonna put those right at the bottom. A little bit of a hoarder in the garden. I save everything that I can. Um, this here is a, uh, a little DIY uh, potting mix. It's a, a mix of um, garden soil, compost, and then also a material called pit moss, uh, which is a, a play on, on peat moss. So this is a peat-free um, sort of uh, substitute for, for peat moss that's made from upcycled uh, plant, plant material. And so that's mixed in here also. I'm going to now, just grabbing. I, I personally, I don't usually wear gloves while I'm gardening. I just, I like getting my hands dirty, <laughs> um, which is maybe the same for many of us tuning in today. All right. I'm going to fill that to just like a, just about an inch. If you can see here, just about an inch uh, below the rim of the bowl so that when I water it, there's room for that, that water to collect. It doesn't spill over. Cut it down gently. And then I'm actually, this is a trick I learned this season that I love. Um, I'm gonna pre-water this right now, trying to not get the computer wet. Um, and what that's gonna allow me to do, I'm gonna, what we're gonna be planting right now is some salad greens, a mix of various lettuces. And because the seeds are so small, by watering first, they're gonna be able to make contact with that moist soil. Um, and then I, I don't have to worry about watering after and then the seeds splashing all over the place. So I'm gonna do that right now water here. Just give that a nice soak. All right, and then what I have here um, is a meta lettuce mix from Hudson Valley Seed Company, a local, local seed company. And I am just going to thinly sow these seeds. Now, um, if you you know, if you're gonna try this trick at home, if you're looking to get really, you know, sort of large heads of salad greens or lettuce that you might find be more familiar with the market, you're gonna wanna give them more space. What I'm doing here is really cut and eat. I'm gonna be growing this as a cut and eat little salad bowl or lettuce bowl. So I'm gonna be uh, cutting at it pretty frequently and getting more micro, uh, micro greens out of, not micro greens, but my little lettuce heads. So I'm just gonna sprinkle thinly. And then as these are coming up, I'll thin them further about two inches apart roughly, um, and I'll eat the thinnings. So I've been doing that with uh, the, an arugula bowl that I did with the same method, uh, and it's quite tasty to have those. So there we go. And then I'm just going to take a little bit more of the, the potting mix that I showed you and just lightly sprinkle like so, so the seeds are just, just 
barely covered. And I'm gonna put this in a nice sunny spot. If you had a really sunny, bright uh, window, this should do just fine there. Again, you can experiment and see. Um, I'm gonna put this in uh, probably right on this table actually in the sun. Um, and then see, see what happens. I did this similar method just to show you here, sort of salad bowl attempt with arugula. Uh, it really needs to be thinned. You can see how thick and dense it's growing here. Um, but these are extremely tasty. So, I, you know, when I do thin them, which I usually do with some a small garden shears, um, I'm just, I just pop that in a salad and it's quite delicious. Uh, so that is, that's on my, my agenda for, for the weekend in my garden list. Um, and I just want to show you a couple more things and we'll open up to questions. If you don't have access to seed, I know that's, that's been an issue right now. I've been getting some questions about where, where can I find seed right now? Um, again, sort of good problem to have some of the, some of the seed companies that I normally recommend like Baker Creek, um, and also Renee's seeds, um, seed savers exchange. They're experiencing incredible, uh, an incredible influx in, in demand right now. And so there are delays. Be patient. I would still recommend trying to go to Baker Creek. I think when I checked yesterday, they're going to be back online on May 11th. So you can try to order some seeds there. Um, but if you don't have, if you're having trouble accessing seeds, you know, a lot of what I do in my garden is saving, uh, saving vegetables that I really love from the market, let's say, and saving the seeds. Um, so you can do that. That's great for especially things like squash, watermelon. I have a few particularly tasty varieties from market trips last summer that I'm going to be growing this year. And then I have two couple of experiments to show you. If you can see here, um, this is actually, it may be a little tricky to see, but if you, you may be able to see a little bit of orange right in there beneath these little seedlings. So this was a little sun gold, dried up, shriveled up sun gold tomato that I found in our cherry box container. And I know that it was from our sun gold tomato we had last year because we were growing sun gold up the trellis right nearby. So somehow this little dried up sun gold cherry tomato uh, over stayed over winter, didn't rot, and was just below the soil. I found it when I was transplanting some alliums. Um, and so I plucked it out, put it in this little pot, put it under a grow light. Um, and then about a week later, I took a little scissor and just very gently tore away at the, or cu cut into the skin of the tomato. And sure enough, all of these little seedlings had, had appeared. So I saved this to show you all, cause I'm excited about it. And what I'm going to do is thin and try to try to see if I can grow a whole new, uh, tomato out of this little shriveled up cherry tomato uh, that overwintered. And then the second, the, the last thing I want to show you here, again, if you don't have access to seed, you may have someone nearby who has, um, has some plants where you can propagate from. Uh, that's another, another method. And plants like mint are incredibly easy to propagate. So I'm going to show you here. I took these mint cuttings five days ago on Saturday, put them in some water, and you can see that they already have some really nicely established roots. So the, the trick here, it's very simple. Take cuttings that are about, an, about eight centimeters in length, just, around a, just below a leaf node. Put that in some water. Um, I'm going to let these roots establish a little further. And then I should have some nice new mint plants. And I am going to try growing these actually indoors. So these are from my outdoor mint plant. And I'm going to take them um, and try to try to grow some mint in my uh, one of my window sills in my inside the apartment. Um, so again, lots of different ways that you can uh, get creative and adapt to what you have access to during this time. Uh, there, there's a the, the, again, there's a lot of interest in gardening right now, and I assure you, you are not alone. Probably even on your street, wherever you live, and interest in gardening right now. Um, so I encourage you. This is a great time to find ways to reach out to your neighbors um, and, uh, you know, and again, see if you can share some of these resources. So with that said, um, I'd be happy to take some questions. And I, I, again, thank you for joining me here in, uh, in my garden today, live from New York. Excellent. Thank you, Kelly. So many valuable tips and tricks in there. <laughs> I think people are probably listening closely and we do have a few questions. So We'll jump right into that. Thank you for that. That was fantastic. Thank um, you. 
a question on what the best material for containers. You covered this a little bit and you used a bowl that was clearly not designed for planting, but can we yes. use recycled material? Are any materials dangerous to grow in and how do we kind of choose materials that will be beneficial? Yeah, I mean, I, well, that's a great question. You should definitely be looking to see is something corrosive or there are toxic materials in what you're growing and, and avoid that. Um, we, I typically, you know, try to grow in ter terracotta and wood. Those are my preferred. Most of the planters around the garden are those things. Um, but, you know, again, if you have a ceramic pots or uh, pans or, Plastic is fine. You know, I actually, per personally, this is my personal opinion. Um, if you do have plastic around the house, I try upcycling it as much as possible, right? Um, so while I prefer growing my plants in terracotta, wood, those kinds of materials, um, I certainly would rather reuse, um, you know, a plastic bin in some way that I have for some reason, rather than um, recycling it even, or, or you know, worse, throwing it out. Um, it's a great question. I don't necessarily have a list of sort of dangerous materials, but you should be thinking about that absolutely. Um, and thinking again about what are you planning to put in there, right? What is the specific plant that you're going to put in there? And is it going to be happy in that, um, in that container that you're putting it in? Excellent. Perfect. And you mentioned the um, pallets that you use. So I think maybe that's a place where they pay, just pay close attention to where those pallets are coming from. Yes, um, absolutely. You know. <laughs> and these, these pallets um, came from, a, we have a wonderful garden center called the Urban Garden Center that's just a little bit up in East Harlem, located under train tracks. It's, it's as cool as it can get. When you're able to travel again, and if you're coming to New York, I highly recommend a trip to the Urban Garden Center if you're interested in this topic. Um, and they have, they, those two of the reclaimed um, pallet containers, they actually, those are planters that they built. So find trusted sources, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Great, perfect. But I love how creative you've gotten with the different, um, it's so fun, I think, to see a garden with a very dynamic and different containers and boxes. And so use what you have for sure. A question about pollinators coming from the rivers. How high is your terrace? And do pollinators have any trouble getting that high? And can they actually survive in a, such a dense and urban environment? Uh, I, I love this question for a number of reasons. So we're about 12 stories up. We're on the sixth floor, but this, our apartment building has uh, has duplexes, some, some sort of quirky layouts of the apartment. So we're the equivalent of about 12 stories up, which is not very high by Manhattan terms. Um, so we have a lot of pollinators that that come in. I, I One of my goals is to, to one day get a, a really good bee book and work on my bee identification, because uh, we do have a lot of different varieties. I know enough to know that we have many different varieties coming through over the course of the season and in the past few days we had a really wet and cold April here in New York um, so the, the these first few days of May have been um, finally the sunshine has arrived and the pollinators have come with them um, so we have no issue we have pollinators coming through um, our cherry trees just went out of blossom and I'm seeing little fruits so that's telling me that they they've been cross-pollinated um, successfully which is great news for me <laughs> um, I will share a little tidbit on this I actually when I first uh, moved to New York City was working with my father on the opening of a, a, hotel, a new hotel in truly midtown Manhattan 54th on Broadway um, it, it is it was at the time I believe still is the tallest hotel in the Western Hemisphere. So giant skyscraper in the middle of Manhattan. And the hotel team was really dedicated to promoting sustainability in their operating principles. And so within the, the, the first summer that they opened, worked with some local beekeepers to put hives 723 feet above the ground. Um, and they, they were up there and they would fly down uh, to Central Park and come back to their hive uh, and were able to produce honey up there. So, um, you know, I, I, I will say that growing in an urban environment has taught me that, again, nature will find a way. Uh, that, that is not a, that's not an issue. <laughs> and what a great thing to create environments for wildlife and bees and pollinators and all that thing so maybe in this yeah. dense urban environment they're looking for your plants because <laughs> that's what i'm them. thinking happened with the cucumber beetle it was like, Wait, there's the squash found it, it. <laughs> grabbed it <laughs> 
Great, thank you. And a question about your raspberries. Do they winter over or do you treat them like annuals? Um, she uh, has a balcony and is really interested in doing some berries. That's great. I would highly, this is a heritage red raspberry. I would highly recommend it. It overwinters just fine. I don't move it in. I don't wrap it. Um, we prune it bef uh, once, once a year. Um, and it actually, this variety gives a, a harvest in the early part of the summer and then again in the fall. Um, so it's a great plant for plant for containers. Um, and again, you can see it right behind me. Just in the past couple of days, I'm starting to see the first buds. So we should have some fruit in in a little bit. Um, but everything stays out here. The, all, uh, the only thing that I bring inside is our fig tree. Um, and I'm going to actually try to wrap that in burlap this year for the first time. Great, thank you. I did learn something last year in planting a blueberry, which the very knowledgeable people at my town's garden store said, oh, do you have acid? Your the berries, blueberry, I don't know about other berries, but blueberries like a little more acid soil. So there was a, an amendment I added to that. So maybe take note of what you're planting and what it might want in the soil. And Absolutely. we'll get Kelly's maybe book recommendations to send in a follow-up email so you could do yeah. that research. All we right. actually put pine bark mulch in our blue, just click on that pine bark mulch uh, on the blueberries for a little bit more of a, an acidic uh, approach there. And then also coffee grounds. We put oh, right into sweet. our blueberry plant containers and they seem quite happy with it. Oh, that's brilliant because too much coffee grounds and compost is, can be just too much acid. So that's awesome. <laughs> Another great trick. All right, another question about your, for full sun vegetables like peppers and tomatoes, how can you make sure they're getting enough sun in a north facing space? So I actually, thank you for asking that, whoever asked that, because I forgot to mention why we chose our, where we put the vegetable bed. And I'm just gonna bear with me, I'm gonna turn my camera slightly and hopefully it won't be too choppy, but I wanna show you because it's a perfect time to show you this right now. Um, so if you see along this wall, this wall is actually south facing uh, because we're on the north side of the building. The re our whole unit, our apartment unit faces north, but the sun right now is behind us and thus hitting this technically south facing small brick wall. So this air, this small strip of the garden actually gets maximum sunlight. And when we were deciding, we knew we wanted to put the vegetable bed on this side of the garden. Um, and that's where we grow uh, that's where we grow the bulk. That little bed is where we grow the bulk of our vegetables. So right now there's radishes. Um, last year I had Cherokee uh, purple, uh, purple per Cherokee purple tomatoes, which are in the um, plant a seed kit for Slow Food USA this year. I highly recommend them. Um, they did beautifully there because they get eight plus hours of sunshine uh, during the peak summer months on in that one little spot. So that's my, in my small 200 square foot space, that is the, uh, the sunniest spot and that's where our plants go. And I'll tell you a little side story. It was actually that spot or where that chair is, if you can see that. Um, and that where that, that little chair is in that deck gets about three to four hours less of sunlight a day because we have a very tall building directly behind me. And right now, actually, the sun is headed to go behind it. And so once it crosses behind that building, uh, the sun no longer hits this deck area. So when we were planning back in the getting to know you stage, um, there was a little bit of a debate of do we put the veg bed there where the, the deck is now or do we put the deck in the sunny spot so Kelly can sun bask for maximum hours <laughs> during the day um, but we, we chose the vegetables so the vegetables got the sunshine and I just kind of move closer to them as the day progresses that's a tough decision, <laughs> it, a tough decision. It, took, it took some time to 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 make that call but the yeah. vegetables come out in the end with good choose reason. tomatoes <laughs> exactly choose tomatoes <laughs> Great. And I'm just going to reiterate what you mentioned in the very beginning, which is to really watch your space and get to know your space before you start planting. And even I have, I have quite a bit of outdoor space. And even then, because of the house and the neighbors, I'm watching closely before I plant. We built a new bed and I kept a really close eye on it for about a week to see if it was going to get enough sun for what I wanted to put in it, which is tomatoes. Exactly. So I think you said it was very important to do that part. And I want to reiterate that for, for maximum success. Or exactly. potential at least. <laughs> so a good question about planting in pots and how do you determine how big of a pot to use? Um, and do you recommend always doing companion planting or some varieties just want to be alone in their pot? 
And then I'm going to tack this on, which is another book recommendation I'll ask after um, to follow up is any book recommendations on learning companion planting, what goes well with what. So the first question is how to decide how big of a pot a plant needs. And the second is how to figure out if it wants companion plants and what kind of companion plants it might like. Okay, perfect. Um, <laughs> starting with, I'm going to try to digest that all, and you can help me, Giselle, yeah. to get back on track if needed. Um, the size of the pot really depends on what you're growing. So I usually, for every plant that I have in mind, uh, I, I will do research on what does it want? Uh, you know, what is its ideal situation and can I provide its ideal situation? Uh, sometimes if the answer is no, I can't, I'll just say, well, that's not the best plant for me to be growing. Sometimes I'll say, you know, let's test it out and see if I, you know, without, without, you know, intentionally saying, okay, this is going to be bad for the plant. Again, plants have, there's, this isn't a perfect sort of yes or no usually answer for, for plants. Um, you may just not get as, as a productive of a plant, right? Or the, the plant may focus more on its foliage than, uh, let's say if it's a fruiting plant, than putting out flowers and, and fruit, depending on what pot you give it. So you really want to do um, research when deciding on the type of container you're going to use and the size, research on what you're planning to grow in that, in that space. Um, you know, I, and I, I do kind of like, I'll, again, I'll experiment. I have kohlrabi and I'm looking at it right now, a six inch by six inch wooden box. It's about six inches deep. Um, and I'm going to see how that does. Cause that's what I have right now, especially at this time when, again, we don't have, um, you know, we're, we're more limited to our, our choices in some way right now. Um, and that's okay, you know, do a little bit of experimentation, but, but again, first do your research on what you're, what you're looking to grow um, and what would be happiest there. In terms of the second question on, you know, whether you grow something with companions or alone, again, it depends on the, on the plant. So I'll do a lot of research beforehand to, uh, to ask the question of, will these things be happy growing together? Does this one thing need a lot of space and so would be crowded out? Um, you know, I, I tr and this is a process still for me that I learn more year over year because it really has to do with what you, what, what you're working with in your space. So even if you have gardened for years, if you're in a new space, you need to do some relearning in conjunction with where you are. Um, so I'll do a lot of, you know, a lot of upfront research and trying to kind of match not just companion plants for health of the plant, but also just structural. Is it something that creeps over the side of the, uh, of a pot? Is it something that will happily kind of sprawl? Uh, like you may have seen in the video, we have creeping thyme in the box behind me and that will just like happily sprawl all over, uh, all over the box. And then I grow beans up out of that, right? So I'm taking advantage of a planter box in many different ways within that space. Um, for resources, I actually brought these specifically because I wanted to show them to you, but these are my two absolute favorite guides on companion planting. Um, carrots love tomatoes and roses love garlic uh, by Louise Riott. And my partner actually introduced me to these books. And I now have them out uh, literally all season long. Um, I just kind of keep them at the ready. And if I'm planting radishes, let's say, I will leaf to the radish section and take a look at um, you know, some of the tips that are in these books on what they like to grow well with, what you should not grow, uh, you know, for example, brassicas and, uh, you know, a certain other kind of plant family, right? Um, these, these two books are phenomenal. I can't recommend them enough. I also sometimes will just do like a quick sort of companion planting search when I'm, when I'm planting, but usually my first go-to are roses love garlic and carrots love tomatoes. Excellent. I like the names of those books so much. Aren't they great? <laughs> yeah, and I've been trying to learn a little more about companion planting too, like what wants to be friends. My brother gave right. me this very, very cute book. It was like this little romantic view of companion planting, but something I've thought a lot about, like this is a lot like an overstory and an understory in a forest. Like exactly, the, the timing becomes really important. Like th is this going to grow at a time when these really need light underneath or will the timing kind of work well with them? So exactly. Something I like to think about in doing companion planting. So I want to honor your time time we do have several more questions so I'm going to try to pull a couple of these a couple of these um and we can follow up with the others so uh do you have any tips for getting rid of slugs and snails <laughs> <That's a> question <laughs> um learn to love them 
<laughs> Again, I'll tell you, I, I honestly wasn't expecting to have as big of a slug and snail presence up here on the roof as we do. I am assuming they come in with the birds. I don't really know, but they are here and they're here to stay. Um, I almost, because we had this cold, we had a cold, wet winter, like I said, it was also, rel it was mild. It was a weird sort of back and forth with the temperatures. We didn't have any hard frost. It hardly snowed here in New York. Um, so I'm actually anticipating, I'm a little um, sort of wary this year of some, any disease issues we may have because things didn't really die off, including the slugs. Um, so by mid-March, uh, you know, or again, almost two months ago, the slugs were just doing their thing, eating away at the radishes. Um, I had to pretty quickly, my, my go-to is beer traps actually, so I will use, um, use old beer, just put it in like a, a, a Tupperware container and sort of semi-bury it in, the, in our raised bed and they go to it like they love it and they go right to it um, and then they, they sadly drown a beer filled death. Um, but again, I don't wipe them out, you know, it's just to get the population down. It was a really, we had a lot of slugs. So I'll, I'll only do that, uh, that little, that beer trick when they're becoming a problem. I also showed Giselle this before we got started, but this is actually, it's a, my like favorite little slow food uh, uh, slug trap, <laughs> as it were, the snail that's meant to trap the slugs and snails. And I got this in Belgium from a gardening store. And if you look, it's actually, you're supposed to put beer in here um, and it has a little opening and the idea is that they go in there and they, they have their, their fill and they don't come back out, so. <laughs> That's my, that's my tip. Other than that, it's, you know, it's just, we, we have slug damage on our, on our stuff and it just tells me that the veggies are probably really tasty and I am also going to enjoy them. <laughs> Great. It doesn't seem like a beer bath is the worst way to go. I think <laughs> Okay, great. I'm going to throw one more question at you before I let you go. And that's about watering. So Trina is asking about the rain barrel and if everything in the garden is hand watered or do you have a drip system or what's your sort of method for watering? And then I will tack on a little bit your approach in getting into winter. Just a small comment on that. Maybe we can check back in in the fall, but um, what happens in, in the winter with the garden? That's great. Um, and thank you for asking because I didn't really touch on it. The first year here, again, we're going into third year in this garden, we hand watered everything. So we would, that if you just saw the watering can that I, that's a two gallon watering can, and then we have a three gallon watering can, and we would just take those down to our bathtub, fill them up, and then walk them up here. So this is sort of a tiered layout. So where we are right now, the rest of the apartment is not level with it. So you, there's stairs to get into our, into our apartment. Um, so we were hand watering and it was our, it was our workout for the summer was carrying the water up, uh, and, and watering, hand watering our plants. It quickly, by the end of the season, that would take a, a long time, uh, and also not necessarily be the most effective for, uh, for our plants. So within the, the first, um, the first year, we actually put in a drip irrigation system. So that rain barrel it doesn't actually act as a, a rain barrel. I would love for it to, but we just don't have this set up in our apartment for it to actually catch rain. So it's more of like a, a holding tank for water. Um, and again, my, my partner here actually tapped into the sink in our bathroom and uh, piped, the, had, basically has the water uh, pumping up into that holding tank. And so then we have a reservoir where we now, we have drip irrigation uh, lines that come out of that, that hold tank. Uh, and during the summer months are on a timer. So it's usually once in the morning and once in the afternoon. Uh, we have little lines that go out from the drip irrigation, the main line, but not every pot. Again, because I have containers all over the tables. I have it in the, you know, wherever I can grow something, I'm growing something. So there's definitely hand watering that still happens, but the bulk of the, the beds and the larger boxes are, are hooked up to a drip irrigation system. Um, and then what, winterizing. Uh, you know, it, honestly, I, again, I try to, like you were saying, Giselle, I try to extend the season as much as possible. So there's definitely a transition moment that happens in September, October, where I'm trying to grow different things out here as much as possible. I would love to, one of my next things that I want to try is a cold frame, uh, which Cynthia, who I believe did, did, a, did a little program on this, is part of the slow gardening community. And I know this is her big passion, passion area. So that's a project that I'd like to work on in my garden. Um, 
we, you know, I tend to focus on my indoor garden space once winter hits. That's sort of been the general trend, uh, both in terms of house plants, but then also I've got a small little uh, uh, hydroponic system that's just like a countertop, uh, cute little kitchen system, um, growing herbs and things in the windowsill. So it, it gets much quieter, but I do tend to focus on the indoor garden, uh, indoor garden more. And then just like, you know, tactically, that's my season where I'm doing a lot of planning. Um, I'm watching all of the equipment that I've used here and kind of putting the garden to bed for, for the season. Excellent. And you've got some great berries and perennials out there. So you still get a little bit of plant life on that. Oh, yeah, exactly. On that balcony exactly. over the winter. Perfect. Exactly. All right. Well, I want to honor your time and let you go. Um, thank you so much, Kelly. This has been really interesting and informative. Um, and we really appreciate you being with us today and showing us your garden and sharing all these tips with you. For all of you who joined us today, thank you for being here. Um, on the note of seeds, I do want to mention, Kelly mentioned the plant a seed campaign that is happening. We still have a handful, not a lot, but we still have some kits left over. So I put the link in the chat and I'll put it in one more time. You can use the code Slow Food Live for free shipping, all one word. And there's five awesome Arc of Taste seed varieties in that kit, including that Cherokee purple tomato <laughs> and also white Sonora wheat from Baker Creek, which I'm going to put in my garden in the fall to try to get a little cover crop in there for the winter. So check that out. Um, we've got that link in there. Check that out and get yourself a kit if, you, if you're having a hard time getting your hands on some seeds. And keep up with Kelly at Table and Tilt. She's on Instagram and her website is in here and we'll follow up with a link to her website and social media and some book recommendations from Kelly for you. Kelly, thank you so much for everything you do in New York City and beyond for Slow Food and for joining us today. This has been really wonderful. Thank you for having me. It's been great to, to talk with you all and, and happy growing. Have fun with it. <laughs> <laughs>